When a person or an animal is given an antibiotic, not all of that antibiotic is metabolized by the body. Some of that antibiotic can enter our environment through the waste of that human or animal. In general, human waste is treated before being emitted into our environment. But as we know from the most recent EPA Urban Wastewater Treatment Report, there are still 35 locations around Ireland where raw sewage is emitted in the vicinity of recreational waters. So if there are antibiotics or antibiotic residues or antibiotic resistant bacteria present in that waste of that human or animal, there is potential for them to enter our surface waters or enter our groundwaters, which may act as the sources of our drinking water supplies or indeed where, which we use for recreation. There are many different types of antibiotic resistant bacteria, but the ones the majority of people around the world are concerned about now are organisms called CPE or carbapenemase producing enterobacteriales. The enterobacteriales, part of the name, um, refers to a group of bacteria that live naturally in the guts of humans and animals. And the CP part of the CPE name refers to an enzyme that the organisms can produce to break down lots of the antibiotics we need to treat very serious infection. In 2017, our research group published the first report of the detection of CPE in seawaters in Europe. At that time, we were carrying out some uh, studies with our local environmental health service who were interested in looking at freshwater streams that naturally run across many beaches around the country. So we were looking at those beaches for the presence of various different organisms, including antibiotic resistant organisms. And on two occasions in the bathing water season of 2016, we detected CPE in these freshwater streams. So that led to a more in-depth investigation of the area in which we detected these organisms and we found that the raw sewage being emitted in the vicinity of recreational waters in that area was responsible for the presence of CPE in those waters. So that initial work led to a larger national level project called ARREST, which is funded by the EPA and the HSC. And through the ARREST project, which began in 2018, we are looking at waters and effluents and manures around the country for the presence of antibiotic resistant bacteria. I'm very often asked, is it possible to define a safe level of antibiotic resistant bacteria in, in water? Or what are the consequences for people who may be exposed to antibiotic resistant bacteria? So that is essentially the research question that the PEER project is hoping to answer. What are the consequences of exposure to antibiotic resistant bacteria in recreational waters? What we are hoping to look at in the PEER project is, is there any difference between people who use water a lot, people who swim a lot, people who surf a lot, in terms of their carriage of antibiotic resistant bacteria versus those that maybe don't use the water at all or very rarely. The PEER project team brings together experts in public health, microbiologists and colleagues in the University of Exeter in the UK who carried out a really interesting uh, survey a couple of years ago called the Beach Bum Survey and found that surfers were four times more likely to be colonised with antibiotic resistant bacteria compared to those that don't use the water so much. In the PEER project we're hoping to look at the Irish population to see is there any difference to what our colleagues in the UK have seen and not only look at them once but hopefully we're hoping to recruit some of you to stick with us for two years to see if the situation changes over that two year period and it's really important for us to be able to understand that that we not only have participants that use the water a lot but we also have an equal number of participants that actually don't use the water at all. So as we're hoping to remind those of you that maybe are really interested in the peer project, but feel that maybe you can't get involved because you're not a water user, that's not the case. We are welcoming and would like to recruit increasing numbers of non-water users to help us to understand how we can improve our recreational water quality. Hey, great, uh, that's the end of video one. So um, my name is Liam Burke and um, I'm the co-lead on the PEER project and I'm responsible for managing the colonization studies, which many of you are involved with. So um, I'm just gonna play a video now just to kind of give you an idea of the progress that we've had made so far on the colonization study and uh, what's coming up for the summer of 2021.
Antibiotics like penicillin are one of the greatest discoveries in medicine. We've been using them for over 80 years to treat bacterial infections, and they're also great at preventing infection, so we can do other procedures like dentistry and surgery. But what would happen if antibiotics no longer worked to kill bacteria? Well, unfortunately, that's already happening, and it's called antibiotic resistance. This is what happens when the bacteria get used to the antibiotics and they change somehow so that they become antibiotic resistant superbugs. What this means for you is that the penicillin that you get from your GP might no longer work to cure your throat, your throat infection or your chest infection, and you might need to go to hospital to get a special antibiotic injection. If we don't do something now to stop the spread of antibiotic resistance, pretty soon there won't be any antibiotics left at work and even a simple chest infection or surgery could be potentially life-threatening. So what can we do? Well, we know that superbugs can end up in our environment through the release of sewage, slurry, and other waste. And these can end up in natural waters. And we're wondering whether this is one way that people can pick up superbugs and get them into human populations through using natural waters for recreation. That's what the PEER project is all about. Do swimmers and surfers pick up superbugs? By taking part in PEER, you're already helping us learn more about how superbugs spread. Our findings will feed into policy and help stop the spread of superbugs in the environment and keep antibiotics working for all of us. So what else can we do? Well, we can use antibiotics wisely. Don't take them for a cold or a flu because they don't work against viruses. Only take them when you need them. And if you have any left over, bring them back to the pharmacy for disposal. If they go into normal waste streams like wastewaters and landfill, they can end up in the environment and antibiotics in the environment just drive antibiotic resistance. So how's the PEER project actually going? Well, since we launched last August, about 1,300 people tried to sign up to the project. Once we've done our eligibility checks, 600 water users and almost 200 non-water users were registered to take part. So far, we've sent out about 370 packs and received back over 300 samples, which means that we've met our initial target of 300 people for the uh, colonization study. About half of everyone who participated also agreed to take part in the persistence study, which is going to start later this year. So where do we go from here? Well, I have good news. Due to the incredible interest of Irish citizens, the EPA have agreed to fund another research around here, which means we'll be able to extend the colonization study into the bathing season of 2021. As well as that, we'll also have the capacity to extend the systems modeling study from an initial um, west coast of Ireland focus now we'll be focusing on the entire Republic of Ireland, and you'll have your opportunity to participate in that also. So, you wondering how you can get involved? Well, the good news is we're going to be recruiting another 300 people to participate in phase two of the colonization study this summer. So, if you're a non-water user, registration is already open on our website, nuigalway.ie forward slash peer. If you previously registered as a water user, we haven't forgotten you. We're going to be tapping up 150 more of you to participate. And if you, all you need to do to participate is find yourself a match control. So somebody from around your area of a similar age and of the same gender as you, and then you can participate. We'll be including up to 150 previously registered water users in phase two of the colonization study. Now's your chance to participate. If you can recruit your own match control, we can include you both in the study provided you still meet the eligibility criteria. You can't have travelled outside of Ireland, had antibiotics, or stayed overnight in a healthcare facility. Recruit a friend, send them to anywaygalway.ie forward slash peer to register, and don't forget to tell them to indicate you as their match water user on the registration form. A quick word for those of you who've signed on to stay with us for the persistence study, which is investigating how long people stay colonised with superbugs, and whether water users keep them longer than non-water users. This first of its kind study will begin once phase two of the colonization study finishes in September. We'll be choosing a representative subset of the people who signed on to continue with us and they'll provide us with a new sample every couple of months until the end of 2022. So that's the plan. It's going to be a busy year for us, but we can't wait to see what our results will tell us. Hopefully we can influence policy to make our waters cleaner and safer for us all. So um, if you have any questions, just stick them in the chat and we'll get to them in the Q&A, um, which is coming up really soon. Uh, so next, I'd like to introduce our PhD student, Maeve Louise Farrell. Uh, so over to you, Maeve. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Maeve and I'm a second year PhD student in the ARM group in NUI Galway. Um, I've previously qualified as a veterinary nurse and did a course in applied bioscience. 
Um, my interests would be the One Health, um, antimicrobial resistance, of course, um, and animals. And apart from that, I love kayaking in the beach and also horse riding. So basically in pier, I was attracted to the role because of the water and to protect our water. And um, so I'll let the video show you my work in pier and basically what I do day to day. So um, take it away, please, Liam. So in pier, we're looking to see if regular water users are more likely to pick up and carry um, our antibiotic resistant bacteria than non-regular water users. The bacteria that we're looking for in pier are essentially gut bacteria. Um, so they are resistant enterobacteriaceae. We're looking specifically for extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing enterobacteriaceae, um, or ESBLs, and carbapenemase producing enterobacteriaceae, or um, CPEs. CPE and ESBLs are bacteria that live in the bowel and essentially cannot be treated by commonly used antibiotics. Most of the time these are harmless and don't cause infection, but unfortunately they are well documented now in Ireland and on the increase. My work in PEER is mainly on the colonisation and persistence study. Um, so we're looking for these two types of bacteria in the guts of regular water users and non-regular water users. So we do this by um, basically plating the sample directly onto selective agars and then go, if there's any bacteria that grows on these agars after the 48 hour period, we'll then purify them and identify them um, using a specific method called Molotov. So once we've found an organism that we're interested in, we'll go on and do what's known as antibiotic susceptibility testing. And basically we just use little discs of um, antibiotics and place them on top of the bacteria to see how the bacteria reacts um, with its growth conditions. And if we have any interesting results there, we'll do PCR to determine what genes this bacteria carries. And we'll also do a DNA extraction and store these for whole genome sequencing in the future so that we can compare it with other results um, found by research in our labs. We have presented pure research both nationally and internationally and we hope that our findings will help to inform policy and also to protect our environment, not just for now but also for the future generations. Thanks for that Maeve. So um, our final video today is from our postdoctoral researcher Dr Sinead Duane. So uh, over to you Sinead. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Sinead Duane. I am a postdoctoral researcher on the PEER study. And my part or my role on the PEER study is to do a systems dynamic modeling exercise. And basically what that is, is we're trying to co-create strategies that will help um, protect and improve our recreational water quality in the future. And hopefully my video today will tell you a little bit more about the, the process and what we're trying to do with PEER. Thanks, Liam. My role within the project is to help co-create change strategies to improve our recreational water usage in the future. So today I'll be talking to you about the different types of approaches that we're taking within PEER and how we feel it can have an impact in society. Protecting our blue spaces, our rivers, lakes and seas, or our recreational waters, is a really complex issue. There are so many competing factors and so many different types of stakeholders that have an impact on the quality of our recreational waters. PEER embraces a One Health approach which invites stakeholders from different backgrounds and sectors to come together to design and implement change programmes that can have a positive impact on society. This is really important as for the first time it opens up the conversation around complex issues such as recreational water quality and recreational water usage to stakeholders that previously might not have had a voice so that by the end of the process, we can come together to go to create solutions that actually have an impact on society. Within PEER, we are in particular seeking to understand the things that are stopping us from using the water, so, the bar so our main barriers. And by building a systems map, we were able to plot where the different blockages are within the system and how they interact with one another. And this is really beneficial when trying to understand how can we actually overcome them in the future. Also, by understanding who the, direct, the stakeholders that are directly or indirectly affected by these kind of issues, we can begin the engagement process whereby the strategies that we start to develop have an impact when they're needed the most. And therefore, we're pro promoting a collective and unified action at both a national and a regional level. So here and here, what do we mean by a stakeholder? So for us, 
in this project, a stakeholder is anyone that's li currently living in the Republic of Ireland and has an interest in protecting or improving our recreational water environments. So you can see in my background in the very distance here, um, this is what we're talking about. So our rivers, lakes and seas. And what when we are, we are inviting everyone to have their voice heard or be part of this conversation. So you could be a regular dipper, um, a weekend day tripper, um, basically, if you have any interest at all, it doesn't matter how you use the water. So it doesn't necessarily matter that you, if you don't go for a swim, um, you might like to go for walks along the shores or the beaches. Anyone that has any interest in protecting our water bodies um, is invited to join the conversation as part of PEER. Our health and the health of our environments are inextricably linked. So by protecting one, you're protecting the other. By participating in PEER, you're helping not only to protect environments like this, but also to help improve your health in the long run. I just want to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for, uh, for engaging within the PEER project. We have a lot of work to do over the next year, but it's going to be really enjoyable. And with your help, we can really have an impact in protecting our recreational waters for the future. Great, so uh, that's it for the, the videos. Um, so I'm just gonna have a look at the chat now and see what kind of questions we have coming through. Um, so you can all, if anyone wants to turn on their cameras, feel free and uh, we just ask you to keep the mics off um, just for, to keep the um, noise interaction down. So let's see. So the first question I have is, other than the one from John, <laughs> is what areas are you looking at in the arrest project that you mentioned? So, Dervla. Yeah, so the arrest project is a jointly funded project between the EPA and the HSC. So we started the arrest project in 2018. And in the arrest project, we're particularly looking at four local authority areas. So we're looking at Galway City Council area, Galway County Council area, Fingal County Council area and Cork County Council area. Um, so it is the reason we chose those four areas was to be geographically representative, but also try to take into account the differences in population structures in the four areas and also the differences with regard to land use. Liam, I think you're muted. Sorry, if anybody wants to ask a follow-up question to any of these, you can you can just open your mic and um, go on ahead. Um, so I'll just move on to the next question now. So it's from Alex and she's just wondering regarding the colonization study, um, I'm a water user, how can I get involved? So I guess there's two different ways you can get involved as a water user. So we opened our registrations back in August of 2020 and we had about a thousand people try to sign up to the project. Um, a lot of people weren't able to be included in the first part of the study because we just didn't have the capacity to sample everyone. So for any of those of you who signed up to the study but haven't yet been included in the study, you can um, take part in the second part of the study if you can find a non-water user who buddy who you can uh, sign up as your match control. Um, so essentially what that means is they need to be from your area around about your age and um, you know give or take five or ten years and they you can't actually live with them for, because we tend to share the bugs um, or the bugs of people that we live with. So if you can find somebody who matches that description, who doesn't use the water, um, you can send them to our website, nuigalway.ie forward slash peer, and they can register through there as a non-water user, and they'll indicate on their form then that you're their matched water user, so we can match you up uh, that way. Um, okay, so... Uh, Moving on to the next question then. Um, so Neve uh, has a question for Maeve. Uh, so um, she's just wondering what's MALDI and how does it help your work? So Maeve, over to you. Yes, so MALDI, um, it stands for Matrix Assisted La Laser Desorption Ionization Time of Flight. <laughs> it's got a really long name, but basically it's almost like a giant laser in a way and it creates smaller molecules from the bacteria um, once we put it in and just helps us to 
identify the bacteria we're looking for. So as you saw in the video, I was picking off little colonies off the plate. Um, I'll purify them and then take them down to mold they tough, off, um, which will just identify the bacteria for me and means that I'll be able to work out which are useful in the research and which ones um, aren't as useful, basically. I hope that answers the question. So I'll just move on to a couple of questions that we got um, during the registration. So um, somebody wanted to know if you have uh, many participants from Wicklow. Um, so we do, we have a very good representation from Wicklow. So I think we have at least 10 people in the water user group and also 10 people in the non-water user group from Wicklow out of about 150 in each group that we sampled so far. So a lot of people, a lot of water users in Wicklow. Um, and then their follow on question was, are you by any chance being funded by any pharma companies or are you totally independent? So our funding comes from the Environmental Protection Agency. So we are 100% funded by the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and then is Wicklow better than Galway? Uh, well, I guess that's, um, <laughs> that's up, for, up for you to decide. Uh, that's subjective. Uh, so Another question that we had before uh, during registration um, was, is the idea that those who swim more in these waters will build up a tolerance to the bugs or be more protected from the bugs, or will they be more exposed and more likely to be infected from them? So Dervla, do you want to answer that one? So again, by the nature of biology and exposure to any organism very much is a, is a host microbe interaction. So whether or not you pick up the organism or not very much depends on your own system to an extent. And I suppose it's one of the questions we're trying to answer in the peer project is, is what is the uh, level of colonization of people who might be exposed to these organisms through recreational waters. And the reason, and that's really the reason why we're focusing on two cohorts and why it's really important for us to have representation from both people who use waters a lot and people who don't use uh, uh, waters a lot so that we can understand if you're exposed a lot to these organisms in water versus those that aren't, what's the consequences in terms of colonization? You can't, so sorry, Liam, again, just to remind me of what the question was, the, the resistance building up. Yeah, so they were just wondering if, if, if people who swim in the waters build up a tolerance to the bugs and as a result will be more protected or if because from swimming in the water they might be more exposed and therefore more likely to be infected. Yeah, so hopefully I've answered to the, uh, the question, I suppose, you know, your gut microbiome is a collection of various different microorganisms. Um, so, you know, the more you're exposed, the more likely that you're probably going to pick up that organism. Now, I mean, as we said, ultimately, it may not have any impact on you, but obviously antimicrobial resistance, as hopefully we've outlined, is a very big problem. Now, it's, it's you know, often referred to as a silent pandemic. It's a major public health issue. So uh, again, you know, controlling the exposure of people to these organisms is, is important. I hope that answers the questions, but if not, feel free to drop another question into the chat and I'll, I'll follow up. Great, so just the last one that came in um, before the event was uh, somebody wanted to know, did anything unusual come up in your research? And do you think that the antibiotic resistant bacteria numbers are influenced by untreated sewage being allowed into our waterways? Dervla, do you want to take that one again? Sure, and I think that actually relates to another question that I see in the chat from uh, Valerie um, in relation to the sewage uh, emitting into our recreational waters. So as uh, many people here may know or may have seen in the latest EPA Urban Wastewater Treatment Report, unfortunately there's still 35 locations around Ireland where there is raw sewage being emitted in the vicinity of recreational waters. Now, this is notified, obviously, Irish Water are aware of this and other uh, enforcement, the enforcement agencies are aware of them. People who manage the sewers are aware of this and they have made great uh, strides in recent years in terms of trying to improve that situation. But again, it's not ideal, obviously, having raw sewage been emitted in the vicinity of recreational waters. The work we've done and the work I referred to in my video just shows us from an antibiotic resistance point of view why it's not a good idea having raw sewage going into recreational waters. Um, so there is, yeah, I mean, it's highly likely that the antibiotic resistant bacteria, or a lot of it that we're seeing in recreational waters, 
is coming from raw sewage. And we've done some studies on this and we've shown that some of the organisms we're seeing would have a human source. But likewise, we've also shown that some of the organisms we've seen have an agricultural source. Because again, antibiotic resistance isn't just a problem for humans, it's also a problem um, for animals. Um, so, you know, again, the, the waste of the human or the animal, if it's got antibiotic resistant bacteria present in the gut of that human or animal, it can potentially be emitted in the waste. And that's why in the ARREST project and in the PEER project, we're taking a, a one health approach. So we're looking at the different sectors. We're looking at the humans, we're looking at the animals, and we're looking at the environment and trying to better understand what the contribution of humans and animals are to what we're seeing in our environment, in the waters. And then, as I said, the PEER project is a follow-on from that to help us understand, well, if they're in the waters, what's the consequence then for the human? Does that answer it? I hope. Thanks, Durba. Um, we've got a question here from P. Bond. Uh, I swim in open water every day and I've found that I do not get colds or flu as often as I used to when I was working in the health sector. Is this a result of my swimming? So, I mean, again, it's almost impossible to answer that because, again, it goes back to, to the individual themselves having a healthy lifestyle. And again, we're very anxious to, to stress with the peer project. You know, we're doing all of this work to understand what's there. But we realize and through the work that Sinead is doing, that access to blue spaces is really, really important. That having a healthy lifestyle, like getting in, it's great that you get into open water um, every day, you know, can help boost your immune system. We've heard this a lot through the current uh, situation we're in, we're in with regard to COVID-19. Having a healthy immune system will protect you against infection. One of the good ways to do that is have a healthy um, lifestyle, which includes regular exercise, be it in interaction with blue spaces or interaction um, with green spaces. But we understand it isn't easy for everybody to take advantage of the blue spaces and the green spaces that we have around the country. And that's where the survey that Sinead is about to launch at the beginning of June will again is another important aspect of the peer project to help us understand why people interact with blue spaces and what might stop them interacting with blue spaces. So I don't know if Sinead wants to follow up on that um, maybe a little bit. Yeah, Darla, thank you. So um, there's a question there that suppose leads on to this as well as what, what are the different processes involved in the work that I'm doing. So the system dynamic mapping or modeling that I talked about has five stages. So the first stage was to conduct a systematic review. So what we did was we looked, we took a global perspective to see what different countries are doing in terms of trying to protect their recreational waters and to improve the recreational quality. But we also looked at the type of stakeholders that were um, involved in, in the design of these interventions and had and use this to I suppose identify different types of stakeholders that should be involved. So phase two was to conduct a, a stakeholder analysis within Ireland. So we spent about six months to, to the last year trying to identify the different stakeholders that are directly and indirectly um, um, involved in recreational water quality. So we all know that um, stakeholders like the EPA, Irish Water, our local authorities, our recreational water users are all direct stakeholders in this issue. They all have um, a voice in this issue and hopefully they have an opportunity to, to discuss it. But I also wanted to broaden the conversation to people that were indirectly um, involved in this issue that people might that mightn't see themselves as being a beneficiary of our blue spaces and give them an opportunity to um, talk about things that might stop them from using the water and the reasons why they, they like to use the water. So phase three um, began the conversations. We conducted 15 in-depth interviews with different types of stakeholders from across the Republic of Ireland. So we talked to water users, environmentalists, um, um, policy makers, regulators, different types of stakeholders to try and identify again, what do they perceive the, the barriers to usage within the Republic of Ireland and how can we begin to develop solutions to some of the problems that are emerging. We're moving on to stage four at the minute, we're launching our national survey at the beginning of June. And again, the purpose of this part of the process is to open up the conversation to every citizen living in the Republic of Ireland. Um, our blue spaces are for everybody and everyone should be able to um, have a voice or have um, a method of communicating the reasons why they don't use the water uh, and the reason, the positive reasons why they do. Now we're going to use this information to build a, what we call a systems map and this is going to be really useful because it's going to help us identify where blockages um, um, are blockages are emerging 
and from this in the future we can help use this information to build policies interventions and develop strategies that can work consistency at, consistently at a national and a regional level as well so hopefully by the end of this process um, we will have begun the conversation and over the next number of years we can continue it to improve and protect our recreational waters or our blue spaces for generations to come Great. Thanks, Sinead. Um, so we have a couple of questions around testing the water and what is the safe level of bacteria in the water. So one of them is from Flossie and the Beach Cleaners. So they say they're based by the 40 foot in Dunleary. We swim daily all year round. What would be a good water tester for us to buy so that we can do our own water monitoring? And, and then Pivond also says if we tested the quality of the water, what is the safe level of bacteria? Dervla, do you want to answer that one? Yes, so uh, recreational water quality in Ireland and across Europe is monitored under the EU bathing water regulations. So under those regulations, they stipulate that through the bathing water season, which they define as being from the 1st of June to the 15th of September, that uh, a quantity of water, typically about 100 mils, is tested from a microbiological point of view, it's tested for the presence of indicators of fecal contamination. So those small volumes of water, I mean, when you think about it, taking 100 mils out of an entire ocean or a lake isn't a huge volume of water to test. Um, and you're looking at it just for the total amount of E. coli that's present and the total amount of intestinal enterococci that's present. And based on the total amount that's found in that 100 mil sample, the water is then defined as being of either excellent quality, good quality, poor quality or sufficient uh, quality. Um, so I have an issue with that kind of a, a regulation of, of, or kind of area or approach to testing waters because the volume is very, very small. And if you're looking just at the total amount of E. coli present without looking at the characteristics of that E. coli, so whether or not it's an antibiotic resistant E. coli, for example, or a toxigenic E. coli, for example, then are you really adequately protecting um, public health? Um, and we've shown in through work that I refer to that we carried out prior to the start of the ARREST project and also through the ARREST project that we are finding antibiotic resistant bacteria, including CPE, that concerning type of antibiotic resistant bacteria that I referred to in recreational waters that are defined under current EU bathing water regulations as of excellent quality. So, I mean, to determine a safe level, that's what the EU says is a safe level of total E. coli. But I believe that the characteristics of the E. coli should be measured as well. There's also another, two other arguments. One to say the bathing water season, as I'm sure many of the people um, in, in, in the group today would agree, you don't just swim or probably interact with blue spaces between the 1st of June and the 15th of September. Many people are swimming and interacting with blue spaces on a year round basis. So should the regulations extend to monitoring the bathing waters on a year round basis, possibly they should. And also, is it appropriate to be testing waters for microbiological indicators of fecal contamination when you know that there's raw sewage being emitted into those waters? It kind of doesn't seem sensible. You should really look at the overall configuration of that bathing water area before you apply regulation. So, I mean, again, the Water Framework Directive is currently under revision and we've submitted these observations into that process, um, not only ourselves, but other groups across Europe to advocate for um, the need to potentially monitor waters for things like, as I said, antibiotic resistance E. coli, look for the actual characteristics of the organism and not just the, the total organism that's present. So I hope that answers it. Great. Thanks so much, Dervla. So there was a couple of specific questions on what we do in the lab um, that maybe Maeve might be able to answer. So um, somebody is wondering, Neve Connell is wondering, what is your lab process and does it take long to figure out if you have your targeted bacteria? Maeve, do you want to take that one? Um, long story short, yes. Um, so basically, I will collect um, the packs from our um, mail service in NUI and then I'll take the sample and place it onto the selective chromogenic agar. So the ones where you saw there was three different color agars. 
um, and they'll incubate them for 48 hours. So I won't know if anything's grown until after the 48 hour period. Um, and from there, I'll purify them, then go to Moldy Toff uh, to see if I have any interesting bacteria. So that'll just tell me if the bacteria is an E. coli or something like that, basically. And then from there, I have to go on to do antibiotic susceptibility testing on them to see if they are um, resistant or susceptible to any antibiotic panels that we are putting them against. Um, and then after that, if they're very interesting, basically we'll be storing them um, in a minus 80 freezer and we're hoping to do whole genome sequencing on them. So this will allow us to um, know more about basically how the bacteria work and also compare them with bacteria that have been found in hospitals or in the project that Derb has already mentioned, the arrest project. Um, so yeah, it does take quite a long time um, from when the sample actually arrives until I fully processed it. But um, yeah, I hope that answers that. <laughs> I think there was um, one other one about infections. I don't think I missed any other ones, but um, the infections that the superbugs we're looking at can cause. So we're looking at ESBLs and CPEs. Um, basically, these tend to kind of set up camp in your gut for a short period of time and clear themselves out. So generally in a healthy individual, they don't cause any illness and will clear themselves out after a short period of time. The issue is if they were to get into, for example, um, our urinary tract, they could cause a urinary tract infection. Or if um, they were to get into our bloodstream, they could cause bloodstream infections. But um, basically they usually do clear themselves out um, in healthy individuals, the worry would be if we were to pass them on to someone who's immunocompromised. But um, yeah, I hope that answers that question as well. Thanks, Maeve. And we just got one in right now from Valerie who says, does taking yogurt or capsules containing live healthy cultures affect the results of your study? Uh, Dervla, do you want to take that one? Uh, well, I suppose, I mean, lots of people take uh, probiotics um, for various reasons, and there's a lot of different research that we're not necessarily involved in that are, you know, kind of advocate and provide some evidence that taking probiotic substances can protect your gut health and others, but that's not an area of research that we're involved in. Um, for us to be able to understand whether or not it would impact on the uh, results of our study, we'd almost have to set up another cohort study to look at people who do use um, live yogurts and other probiotic substances versus those that don't. So unfortunately, in this study, I don't think it'll be able, we'll be able to make any um, conclusions um, with regard to whether or not that has an impact on you becoming colonized with an antibiotic resistant bacteria. But it could be something that we could maybe consider looking at in the future. Okay, so does anybody else have any other questions? Um, you can just put up your hand or turn on your microphone and ask a question if you like, um, if it's easier than putting it in the chat. Just give people an opportunity there. No, okay. Um, I'll just have a look through here to see if there's any that we didn't cover. Um, so some, somebody was wondering about how we are selecting people to take part in the persistent study. So this is the longitudinal study. So for, for people who are involved in the colonization study, we're going to select a subgroup of those people to kind of carry on and those who, those who have uh, indicated their interest in doing so. Um, and really what we're looking for there is representation from different groups and from across the country. So we're going to try and select people based on what part of the country they're from, whether they're a water user or a non-water user, we're going to select an even number of people from both groups. We're going to try and get a representative age spread across um, the different age groups and also maybe include people who surf as well as people who swim uh, and do other water activities as well. Okay. Um, and then there was just another question about um, participating. So for, for participating in the survey, um, just to mention that we're going to be launching the survey on June 1st. Um, everybody who registered uh, interest in taking part in the project is going to be sent a link to the survey. Um, we'll also be doing a, a campaign in, on social media and hopefully in the press to kind of launch it nationally. So we're hoping to get as wide a coverage of it as possible. So um, we'd be encouraging you all, if, if you can, to, to share the survey with anyone you think might be interested in, in um, filling it out. Um, 
Am I forgetting anything else, guys? Or is that about it? I, th I think that's it. I just I'd finally like to say um, again, thanks to everybody for taking time out of your lunch break this afternoon to join us and hear about the peer project. If any questions do occur to you afterwards, just drop us an email. I, I think it's a peer at nuigalway.ie or check out our website. Um, as Liam has said, we're anxious to recruit people to the second phase of our colonization study and also get people involved in our survey. So just keep up to date. We've got, uh, uh, you know, we're visible on Twitter and on Facebook and probably other formats that Maeve is better familiar with than I am. And obviously our website. So all of the registration links and access to the survey will be available on our website. And just again, a sincere thanks to everybody who has already taken part in the colonization study. We couldn't do the peer project if people like yourselves didn't get involved. So really thank you. Advertise it to your friends, um, encourage them to get involved as well. Uh, and that would be great. And if, if you are a water user who's new to the project, who, had, who didn't register in the first instance, you can still participate in the colonization study if you can find somebody who's a match control. So basically we're accepting pairs of people, water users and match controls. Um, and to do that, you basically just get your control to register on our website and then send us an email at peer at nuigawa.ie um, and we can give you a call back and, and register you to the project. Okay, so listen, thanks a million everyone for taking the time out today and um, we look forward to speaking to you all soon and we'll be in touch with um, more news um, by email um, for anyone who's registered and, and uh, keep an eye out for our survey.